Good morning, church. Hallelujah. I want to welcome you today, whether you're here in person in the sanctuary or you're out in the parking lot. I need my parking lot. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Keep it going. Hallelujah. So good to be here today uh, in preparation for our national call to repentance, prayer, and fasting that will be next Saturday, September 26th. Last Sunday and this Sunday, we've been laying a biblical foundation and groundwork for what a solemn assembly is. The title of my message today is Solemn Assembly America's Only Hope, Sound the Alarm. Today, I want to sound the alarm to the church. Last week, we saw before all the revival movements in the Old Testament, there were four factors that happened prior to those revivals breaking out. And we saw how all four of those are happening in America today. The first one is that the nation is in spiritual decline. We looked last Sunday of how America is in real trouble. America is in spiritual decline. We saw that the second factor was that before those movements, there was a righteous judgment that came from God himself. We saw it over and over. We see what's happening in America today. I believe that this pandemic, I believe that many of the things we see happening today are literally a righteous judgment from God to wake the church up to shake the foundation stone so that we'll come back to him. He's tried before, he'll continue to try. The third factor that happened before those revival movements is that God raised up immensely burdened leader or leaders that had that country on their heart. I believe God, we looked at those leaders all across our nation that are calling our country to prayer and repentance. The fourth factor is that they took an extraordinary action and that action most of the time was in the form of calling a solemn assembly. And our leaders all across the nation are calling us to a solemn assembly. And today I wanna sound that alarm that God's impending judgment is on the horizon. I want to ask you to commit to a time of prayer, of fasting, and repentance for our country this upcoming week. And I want to encourage you to join the live stream of The Return, which will be next Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. My scriptures today are coming from the same place they came from last Sunday. Uh, Amy always catches a lot of my mistakes as I send her my message outline. She said, are you sure you want that same scripture from last Sunday? I said, Amy, thanks for watching my back, but I do want that scripture from last Sunday. The prophet Joel in his day, Israel had turned their back on God and there was a righteous judgment from God that had hit that nation and it was a plague of locusts like they had never seen before. There were four different kinds of locusts that had stripped the land bare. There was a drought. And Joel said, there's only one thing that'll turn the judgment of God. And I'm telling you today, I believe there's only one thing that'll turn the judgment of God from America. And that is a return to him with prayer and fasting. Let's look at Joel. If you'd open your Bibles with me. If you don't, it'll be on the screen. Joel chapter 1 beginning with verse 13. Read this with me if you could. Put on sackcloth, O priest, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and the drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Joel chapter 2, verse 12. 
even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. May God speak to us through the reading of his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that it is holy and true, that it will not return to you void. And we just come asking you to move in this sanctuary. We come asking you to move in the parking lot, to move online and to all the people that would hear this message, that it would be an alarm to call us back to you. Holy Spirit of God, we welcome you into this place today. We welcome you. We pray for more of your presence, more of your power, more of your anointing, and more of your grace in this place. Lord, we need you. Begin with us. Make us clear, clean channels through which your word and your spirit could flow. And we're asking that you would bring revival to this building, to the hearts that are in this building, and to the church all across America today. Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do here today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I believe that we stand at a pivotal point in American and world history today. It literally is a juncture, a Y in the road. I had to, I believe it was in the fifth grade, memorize that, that poem, Two Roads Diverged in a Yellow Wood, and I took the one less traveled by. I believe that America is at a crossroad that can permanently seal our nation's course, either for bad or for good, for calamity or redemption, for ruin or for revival. America was find, founded on the biblical foundation stone and has not only turned away, they've even gone against that founding stone on which the nation was birthed. America has even fallen further spiritually, morally, away from God. We've driven God from the public square. We've called good evil and evil good. We've sacrificed over 60 million unborn children and now we seek to do it up until the time of birth. I want to look deeper today at where I believe we are on God's timeline as we prepare for the return for this national solemn assembly. I want you to consider the following. God has a limit. Say that with me. God has a limit. There's a limit to the amount of sin that God will tolerate before he brings judgment and wrath in response. 1 Thessalonians 2.16, the second part of it says, In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. He says that sin builds up to a point and then it reaches a limit that brings the judgment and the wrath of God. Genesis 15 verse 16 says, For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. The Amorites' sin had not reached that limit, but they were approaching it. I believe America is approaching that limit of when God will intervene. 
Jesus said in Matthew 23, 32, fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. The Sadducees and the Pharisees had sinned. Their sin was reaching the limit. And Jesus said, you need to stop or you're going to reach the limit of God's grace and mercy. I want you to understand that according to scripture, God has established a legal limit of sin. I want you to picture a bowl that God has in his hand that holds that sin. We don't know how big that bowl is. We don't know the limits or how close it is to the limit, but that bowl has a limit. And the only remedy, say that with me, the only remedy for a people is to confess their sin and repent. That means to turn from their sinful ways and turn back to God. And that's literally what we're going to do next Sunday. Don't miss the service next Sunday. We're going to have a corporate service of prayer confessing our sins, standing in as a priest between God and our nation, asking for the mercy of God, confessing those sins and praying and asking for God to move. The spiritual healing of the United States of America hinges on and is waiting on the repentance of God's people. That's you and me. That's you and me. Second Chronicles 7 verse 13, God says, when I shut up the heavens so there's no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. God says, you've got to come back to me. You've got to humble yourself and acknowledge your need and ask and pray and seek God's face and turn and come back to him. And his promise is that he will heal the land. I thought as I was finishing up my message, the Lord brought to mind as a child, there were things that I did that were in direct disobedience to my mother and to my father. There was no way that I could fix them or undo them. And I hated it, but I had to humble myself and go to my dad and say, Dad, I'm sorry. I did exactly what you told me not to do. And I'm asking for your help to unsnarl the mess. I believe that's a picture of the church in America today. The mess that we see in our country We have to humble ourselves and ask God to forgive us and to undo the mess that we've created. God has a limit. Number two, the measure we use is the measure we receive. The measure we use is the measure we receive. You better be careful going and pointing your finger at the world because the measure we use is the measure we're going to receive. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, verse 1, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, When all the time there's a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus was not saying don't judge. Certainly you and I need to use discernment and evaluate the fruit that's on the tree, but he's saying be careful how you judge. Be careful how you judge. We've got to be spiritually right with God if we're going to be effective in taking the speck out of our brother's eyes. 
We need to be prepared to undergo the same scrutiny by a holy, a pure, and a righteous God. That's why the church is coming to God in repentance and confession. Better be careful when you go pointing your finger. And that's why God says, get your heart right so that you're ready. God says in Ezekiel 7, 27, the king will mourn, the prince will be clothed with despair, and the hearts of the people of the land will tremble. I will deal with them according to their conduct, and by their own standards I will judge them. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. The measure we use with the world is the measure God's going to be using with us. We better be careful because judgment begins at the house of God. Thirdly, like Sister Gold used to say, none but the righteous. Say that with me. None but the righteous. Only those that are right with God are or will be prepared for God's judgment. Only those that are right with God will be prepared for God's judgment. Look at the word of the Lord to Ezekiel in chapter 14, verse 13. He says, Son of man, if a country sins against me by being unfaithful, and I stretch out my hand against it to cut off its food supply and send famine on it and kill its people and their animals, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they could only save their self by their righteousness, declares the Lord. Church, we've got to be careful not to trust deceptive words and ways that, prevent, that permit us to hold on to sin and try to claim the righteousness of Christ over our lives. In Jeremiah, Israel had trusted that they were God's people and they had the Ark of the Covenant in their midst. Look what he says in Jeremiah 7, verse 8. But look, you're trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods not known? And then come and stand before me in my house, which bears my name, and say, we're, we're, we're safe. We're safe from all these things, safe to do these detestable things. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I've been watching, declares the Lord. I've been watching. See, when God's people make his house a den of robbers, he brought judgment on the nation through the hands of the Babylonians and captured them and enslaved them for years. When Jesus wept over Jerusalem some six centuries later, he prophesied that the destruction of Jerusalem would come through the hands of the Roman army. Look what he says in Matthew 21. He says, my house will be a house of prayer but you have made it a den of robbers. You know what a den of robbers is? It's where God's people live lives of sin all week long and come before the Lord and say, well, we're safe. We're God's people. A den of robbers in our day would be a church of God's people that live and act like the rest of the lost world all week long and come to church on Sunday and say, I'm okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna go to heaven. I prayed that prayer, I joined that church. I, I, I fear that many churches in America look more like a den of robbers than a house of prayer. We must confess and turn away from our sin if we're to receive the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ that he's already provided. And finally, number four, as God's people, we have a choice. Would you touch yourself and say, I have a choice. I have a choice. A choice to either see the impending danger and return to the Lord before he brings the judgment or to say, oh, I'll just wait until after the calamity. I'll just wait until after the disaster and plead for God's mercy. Throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, God's people have followed a pattern 
of falling away from him. There would be a revival. People would be on fire. There would begin to be a gradual decline. The people would move into sin and then into rebellion. We're down here. I believe America is down in here in this category. And either it's revival or ruin. So consequently, God prescribed regular times for his people to renew their covenant relationship with him. They're called out in Leviticus chapter 23. I'd encourage you to look at it this week. There was the weekly Sabbath. That's like our worship service. It's a time for you and I to cleanse our hearts, to get right, to anchor back on the anchor of Christ. It goes on, for, there's the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of first fruits, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Trumpets that just began this past Friday on September 18th that began our 10 days of prayer and fasting that leads into the Day of Atonement on Monday, September 28th. And then there was the Feast of Tabernacles. These were times for people the people of God to renew their relationship with him. Every Sunday morning, we take communion. It, it's a time for you and I to cleanse our heart from any sin, to cleanse our heart from any grudges or grievances we have against our brother or sister. Times of renewing a right relationship with him. And in the Old Testament, we see two approaches to that, those assemblies. The people either turned and came back to God or they folded their hands and said, that doesn't apply to me, I'm too busy and I'm moving on. And then the impending judgment came. First example that I wanna share with you was when King Jehoshaphat saw the three vast armies of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Midianites coming to overtake a nation. And he called his people to fast and assemble, and they prayed. Look how God answered them in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15. The prophet said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. Don't be afraid or be discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but it's God's. I'm going to tell you, I claim that over my life. There's some people here today that you're facing battles that you need to step back and let God fight those battles for you. He says, the battle is not yours, but it's God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Look what God did in verse 22. It says, as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated the Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men of Mount Sur to destroy and annihilate them. In other words, the enemies of God started fighting each other. After they finished slaughtering these men from Seir, they helped destroy one another. Verse 24, when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward that vast army, they saw only dead bodies, say dead bodies, lying on the ground, and no one, no one escaped. I'm going to tell you, church, something. If God would save Israel from the judgment, he'll save America from the judgment if we'll turn and come back to him. When Jonah preached a message about the coming destruction to the wicked city of Nineveh and to their king, they weren't even believers. They turned around and they repented. Look what God did on behalf of an unbelieving nation in Jonah chapter three, verse three. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. 
Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown or destroyed. The Ninevites believe God. Church, I just think we need to believe God. God says it, that settles it, and I believe it. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. You ain't going to believe what I'm getting ready to read to you. You ain't going to believe who he asked to fast. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, he took off his royal robes and covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation the king of Nineveh issued. He says, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Don't let them eat or drink. Get, get that, church. He called the animals to a fast. It was so serious, it wasn't just the people. He said, don't let the animals, don't let your cats and dogs have any cat food and dog food. This thing is serious. But let the people and the animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so they will not perish. Verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. If God will do this for the evil city of Nineveh and for the king of Nineveh, God will do this for America. If we'll turn, if the American people will pray and repent, if the church will, surely God will do this for America. And King Josiah, when he heard God's word read, the Bible said he tore his robes in anguish, revealing how much the nation had offended God, violating his command. Josiah led the nation in a solemn assembly of repentance and look what God did in 2 Chronicles 34, verse 29. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord and with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites, all of the people from the least to the greatest, he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by his pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, his statutes and decrees with all his heart and all his soul and to obey the words of the covenant written in this book. Then he had everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin pledge themselves to it. The people of Jerusalem did this in accordance with the covenant of God, the God of their ancestors. Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all of the territory belonging to the Israelites, and he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. As long as he lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Look at what God did. Look at what the prophet said in verse 26. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your, your heart was responsive and you humbled yourselves before God when you heard what was spoke against this place and its people, and because you humbled yourself before me and tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Now I will gather you to your ancestors and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see the disaster I'm gonna bring on this place and on those who live here. So they took her answer back to the king. If God averted the judgment on Judah and Jerusalem because the people turned. God will surely avert his judgment on America if the church will wake up and seek and repent before him. Just a couple of today's answers to solemn assemblies in communities. In the little town of Cameron, Texas, with a population of 6,000 people, they were in the midst of a drought, critically in need of rain. The community had seen some real setbacks. 
Its only hospital had closed. A major employer had implement, implemented a layoff of workers. The schools were underfunded. The agricultural industry was desperate for rain. Pastor James Poole had attended a solemn assembly workshop. He took the information about the solemn assembly back to his local ministerial association. They decided to call a citywide solemn assembly. Local radio stations summoned the town folks to a day of fasting and invited them to attend the evening for prayer and repentance. Six ministers, representatives from 11 churches and 250 people showed up at the public school cafeteria for the meeting. Poole said, we sense the father bringing remedial judgment on us as a city. So the, at the solemn assembly, Poole declared, concern for the city brought us together and denominational tags are dropped off at the door. It was a special time. People came very open to confessing sin and the Lord took control. The walls of pride began to come down and the Holy Spirit had an awesome power to convict us of sin. The next day, a quarter of an inch of rain fell and the city got a bonus. One of the two suppliers of pornography suddenly removed materials from itself. After a second meeting, rain fell in more abundance and it's been falling ever since. The farmers are rejoicing. Water storage tanks are now full for the first time in several years. Even more powerful is the spiritual rain that has begun to fall, Poole declares. People that we've been praying for all of a sudden just appear in our services now. There was another solemn assembly called in New Mexico by Pastor Kirby Kennedy. He led his church to a solemn assembly. The result was a conviction and a repentance of two staff members who testified to God's work in their lives and rose to ask the congregation to forgive them of their wrongs. Kennedy said all across the sanctuary, people were sobbing as they were touched by God's spirit. Soon the entire front of the sanctuary was filled with people on their knees, sobbing and crying out to God in repentance. The aisles were filled with people going to one another, asking forgiveness and forgiving. Never before have I seen an entire body cleansed in one service, but that's what happened in New Mexico. The last one, the 500 member True Vine Church in Oakland, California is located adjacent to the Acorn Housing Project. The housing project is far too typical of unstable communities where violence reigns. The buildings in the project are riddled with bullet holes. Drug deals transpire openly in the streets. Pastor Newton Carey says, the police don't even come here at night. The church became burdened for its community and began to decide one Saturday night a month to set aside for door-to-door -door evangelism. Before the invasion, the pastor's wife felt the need to pray for the success of the effort. She led a prayer walk around the community, stopping at strategic points to pray and claim the neighborhood. Nothing appeared to happen. So the group marched around the neighborhood seven more times praying for a miracle. Then they held a block party for the project's residents and things began to change. 1,250 people have been won to Christ. People are coming to Christ so fast that records are hard to maintain. At the Sunday morning service, the aisles are filled. The platform is packed with people and others stand outside the door unable to get in. Pastor Kerry declared, if you don't come by 1030, don't come at all because there won't be any room. They scheduled a Friday night service to relieve the congestion in the sanctuary, but Pastor Kerry said, we never saw a vacant seat on Sunday morning. Now the revival has touched the housing project officials who've opened up a community room in the project twice a week for special outreach to the project children who come for a warm meal and a Bible study. Home missionary Bill Sim says, the housing project is a different place. You can only see the children's faces. It's a hundred percent change. It's a hundred 
100% change. Church, I miss those days of seeing God moving at this altar. I miss those days of seeing God's people coming to this altar and the power of the Holy Spirit taking over. I want to sound the alarm today, church. The, in the book of Joel, God's people had experienced a terrible locust plague and Joel said there's only one remedy that will stay the judgment of God. God heard, he forgave, and he answered them. And I want to sound that alarm. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Joel says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It's close at hand. Joel 1, verse 14. Declare a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord, alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Joel 2, verse 13. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows, he may turn and relent and leave a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly. Look who's invited. Bring all the elders, gather the children, bring the nursing mother. Let the bridegroom and the bride leave her chamber. Let the priest who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, God. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Church, that's what America needs today is a 100% change. It will only happen as God's people get right with him, as God's people confess their sins and repent and fast and ask God to use them to start a revival fire in our nation. It can happen. Say that with me. It can happen. Lord, don't pass us by with what you desire to do on the earth today. I'm sounding the alarm and asking you to set aside time in these next 10 days to pray and fast and seek God for our country. I'm sounding the alarm and asking you to watch and participate in the return that will be live streamed on Saturday, September 26th from nine to five. I believe God will do what only God can do. I wanna ask our worship team to come. I just would believe that there is somebody here today and your heart is not right with God and God's calling you to that repentance. Your heart is not right. As I've been preaching, God's been speaking to your heart. There's almost been like a fear of God that's come on you. All you have to do is turn and confess your sins and come back to him. You can make your seat there, an altar. I wanna ask our prayer ministry team to come but if your heart is not right, I want to invite you today to get it right. Would you stand with me? If you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, he's at this altar today. He loves you. He cares about you. And he's just waiting for you to turn today. Let this invitation song be our prayer today. How appropriate, how anointed this was that we open the service with this song. Would you just let this be your prayer before God today? Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loosed. Oh God, we believe it. And yes, we can Break see those it. Those strongholds, Lord, Wonders over our lives. Still those addictions, those lusts to pornography. Break those Body chains today. Break those addictions over our lives. Move those mountains, Lord Jesus. You're still 
still the God that's raising the dead. Oh God, we believe. We believe. Yes, we We believe that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, do what only you can do. you to move and do what only you can do. 
move in this building, move in this parking lot, move and touch the hearts and lives of people that will hear this message on the internet, online. Let your presence and power move. God, we humble ourselves before you. We thank you and praise you for your presence in this building today. And we commit every heart and every life to you. In the name and by the power of Jesus Christ, we ask and pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. I want to thank you for being online with us today. We want to hear from you. Send us a message. Let us know what God's doing in your life. God bless you today.